OK. Uh, OK, here's something some kind of interesting that happens with the public key encryption mode. Okay, now, suppose, um, and just to be concrete, let's say aggressive mode, but it also works in main mode. It works in either, either case, but let's say aggressive mode. OK, so here's Trudy. Trudy just wants to cause trouble. Okay, so she generates an exponent A. She'll say, OK, that's like Alice's uh, Diffie-Hellman exponent. She generates an exponent B. She generates two nonces, calls them RA and R sub B. Given that, what Trudy can do, if you go back and look at the picture here, these are just public key operations, right? She can, you know, use Bob's public key, put Bob in there and encrypt it. She can create, a, <coughs> she can use Alice's public key and encrypt that with Alice's public key and so on and so forth. So the point here is, and even the proofs, she knows everything that goes into the proofs here. So the point is, Trudy could do something weird like this. She could pretend to be Alice and at the same time pretend to be Bob and create a conversation between Alice and Bob Okay, that looks legitimate. In fact, even Alice and Bob, who sit here with their private keys and decrypt everything and check the proofs, to them it would look legitimate. It fits the protocol, satisfies all the requirements of the protocol. Okay, so is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, of course it's gotta be a bad thing, right? Well, okay, we kind of saw this in chapter nine. We saw some examples of this. What did we call this? Where you can fake a conversation that looks to be legitimate between the users. Didn't we have a homework problem on that? <laughs> okay, maybe not. Okay, but we call this, there's a word for this. We call this plausible deniability. It means that if, why would you want this, okay? Or why might you not want this? I mean, it, it, so the real question here, is this a feature of the protocol or is this a flaw of the protocol? Okay, when you first see it, you say, obviously it's a flaw. But if you read the documentation on IPsec, they say it's a feature. <laughs> okay, so what's going on here? here? Here's the thing. Suppose Alice and Bob actually have a legitimate conversation and somebody records it and suppose it's like a, you know, a court of law. They call them in later and they say, okay, you guys had this conversation. Reveal your keys to us. Tell us what you said. You know you're going to go to jail forever. Well, they could say, look, we didn't have that conversation. Somebody just faked the whole thing. And in fact, that's, it's true that someone could have faked the whole thing. In fact, anybody could have faked it. Alice could have faked it. Bob could have faked it. Trudy could have faked it. Anybody could have faked the whole conversation. So they can deny the conversation took place, and they can do it plausibly. It's a believable. OK, so is that a feature or a flaw? Depends on whether you're going to be doing legal stuff or illegal stuff. No, it depends you know, on what you want in your uh, in your protocol. You can certainly deny that the conversation ever took place. Okay? So in this particular mode, it's considered a feature. All right? If you don't want that feature in your protocol, don't use this mode. Okay? Use some different uh, key option. Um, now, how can it be considered a failure? Can you think of a case where it might actually cause problems? Someone did not understand possible deniability. You could take a conversation between, say, a member of the NSA and a member of the uh, North Korean embassy. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully your boss at NSA understands plausible deniability. You're going to be in jail for a long time. <laughs> but, right. Uh, okay. So, uh, but another case you might think of is suppose you actually buy something online, right? And you use this protocol that's got plausible deniability. And Alice later repudiates the whole transaction, said, you know, the stockbroker thing, and says that that never took place. You can't prove it ever took place because anybody could have faked the whole thing, unless you require some signature, something else beyond, you know, what's, what's built in the protocol. So, you know, in some situations, it could be a problem. Okay. Uh, okay, so just about the end of phase one here, thankfully. <laughs> uh, we mentioned these. Uh, you can see this IC and RC, this initiator cookie and responder cookie. And I said, okay, just think of this as like a, an identifier for this particular connection between Alice and Bob. Now, um, if you read, again, if you read the RFCs, they, they call these, I have a really great name for these, I love this, they call these anti-clogging tokens. Okay, and the stated purpose is that they're trying to uh, prevent or at least reduce the severity of denial of service attacks. 
Okay, now what's the trick to preventing denial of service attacks? What you want in a protocol is going to make it harder to do a denial of service. What? Uh, you probably want to be able to open multiple connections in many cases, right? And you could, anyway, you could forge your IP address anyway and you wouldn't know it was coming from you, right? So. Low overhead, I guess? Uh, low overhead, okay, you're on the right track. What's the lowest overhead from, say, the server's point of view? It's like no overhead, right? Okay, what does it mean, no overhead? It means it's stateless. Okay, you don't have to remember anything about an ongoing transaction, right? And so that's the thinking, right? So, okay, so apparently that was the thinking, <laughs> okay? That they wanted to use these IC and RC so that the server could remain stateless, right? Or at least for as long as possible. But if you look at the protocol, any version, you know, any of the key options, whatever, the very first message you send a crypto proposal, right? Alice sends them. That's required in the proof in every case. So that means from the very first message, Bob has to keep track of state. He has to maintain state. So whatever they were thinking here, um, they didn't do it. All right. Uh, okay, so the, the last word here, I guess on phase one at least, is when we're finished with phase one, technically we've done Ike. Okay, we've done this internet key exchange. We've got mutual authentication. We've established a shared session key, okay? That's what we've accomplished. <coughs> Now, uh, they call this the Ike Security Association. I don't know if it's just a buzzword. Um, now, this phase one is, you know, at least in this public key versions, is kind of expensive. You know, you're doing public key operations. And if you did the main mode, you did six complex messages and all that sort of stuff. Now, the people who developed Ike thought it would be, you know, used for everything. So they thought, here's what's going to happen. You use uh, Ike, you do this phase one you get this Ike Security Association, and now you can do all kinds of stuff. You could do IPsec, you could do you know, secure file transfer, whatever, using this one you know, session that you've established. So when you do multiple things, you have to get sort of cheap connections based on that session, much like what we talked about in SSL. However, that's not the way it's really used. Okay, it's used for IPsec and that's it. <laughs> okay, so given that that's the case, um, it really doesn't make sense to have this second phase, right? You'd be better off if you just had a single phase and then went directly to doing the stuff you need to do for IPsec. But you can't do that because it's not the way the protocol works. You do the phase one, then you have to do another phase. Now, finally, you can start encrypting packets. Okay, so the phase two, uh, we don't want to say too much about that, um, but it's really analogous to the SSL sessions and connections. You've already gone to all the work to do this costly phase one, so make the phase two cheap and make it uh, use the key that you've already established. Okay, that's the idea. Uh, okay, so just for completeness, uh, here's the protocol. I don't really expect you to know much about this. The point is <coughs> there's no public key operations here. It just relies on symmetric key stuff. So it's efficient, only takes three messages, so it's efficient in every sense. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, after phase one, so, so the point is now we've done the phase one, done the mutual authentication, established a shared symmetric key. We do the phase two, now we're good to go, okay? We're actually ready to do something. So everybody's got their shared symmetric key, we're satisfied, you know, Alice believes she's talking to Bob, and vice versa. Now what? Well, Okay, so if you compare this to SSL, when we got to this point in SSL, what did we do? We moved on to the next topic. <laughs> okay, because in SSL, you're done, right? You're ready to go, you just, what do you do? You encrypt and integrity to protect the packets. There's nothing more to say. Here, you have to think a little bit about what's going on because we're actually operating at the network layer and that just makes things inherently more difficult. We have to think a little bit about what we're doing. Okay, so we want, what we're trying to protect here, since we're at the network layer, we're trying to protect IP datagrams and IP packets. Okay, so what is an IP datagram? 
well, we have to think about it again from this perspective, this uh, network layer perspective. Well, of course, it's simple. I mean, datagram includes a header and data, right? What could be simpler than that? And recall, we talked about the header before, you know, it includes stuff like the source and destination IP, time to live, and so on and so forth. What's the purpose of the IP header? Why is it there? <coughs> Come on, if you took a networking class, don't be shy. That's right, it's all about routing the packets through the network, okay? So, one important observation is, we cannot encrypt this, okay? Why can we not encrypt this? <laughs> because the routers have to see this information, right? So we can't hide this from the routers. So Alice and Bob sitting here cannot encrypt it because the routers wouldn't know where to send the packet. Well, okay, maybe we can't encrypt it, but surely we can integrity protect it, right? Not so fast, okay? Now think about it. If you're implying the integrity, apply the integrity protection and do the integrity check here between Alice and Bob, what does that mean for the routers? It means you better not change anything that appears in that header. Do routers change anything that appears in this header? Yeah. yeah. Things like time to live, fragmentation, lots of things can change in here. Some of it shouldn't change. I mean, things like source and destination, you could conceivably apply integrity checks to, but not everything. So even integrity is not so easy. We can't encrypt, and we can only integrity protect certain things. Okay, well, okay, that's for the header. What about the data? Well, of course we can encrypt and integrity protect the data, right? I mean, come on. Well, not so fast, okay? Think about this. Uh, just to have a concrete example, suppose you're browsing the web, okay? Then what's the data? We're at the IP layer, okay? What's the data? The data there encapsulates TCP and HTTP, right? Because those are the higher layer protocols. So in particular, the data includes stuff like TCP header, okay, and the protocol, the application protocol, HTTP, all that header stuff. So what? Let's encrypt it, right? Why might that be a problem? Well, it doesn't affect the routers, right? They don't care. They don't have to see this stuff. They just see the stuff in the IP header. But who might it affect? Firewalls, okay, think about it. Here's Alice and Bob doing IPsec. Here's their firewalls in between. Firewalls want to look at stuff like this, right? If this stuff's encrypted, they can't see it. They wouldn't even know what the application is, right? So you really limit what the firewall can do. So even encrypting the data, oh my God, this is getting 